Hello, my name is Paul Scherer. I'm chairman of the FAST Ethernet Alliance and director of technology development at 3Com. Today I'm going to talk a bit about 100 megabit per second Ethernet, also called 100 base T or FAST Ethernet. To outline my talk today, first I will begin by giving a little bit of motivation behind developing FAST Ethernet. Then I will review what Ethernet is, how it works, how it's been deployed, and what the current options are for Ethernet. I'm going to talk about how fast Ethernet is being standardized and where it is in the standardization process. Then I will discuss how fast Ethernet can be deployed in today's networking environment, discuss the range of Ethernet family solutions all the way from shared 10 megabit Ethernet to switch 100 megabit Ethernet. And then finally I will compare fast Ethernet to other high performance network technologies. But first, why fast Ethernet? If you're going to call something fast, I suppose that it means that you want something to happen quicker or more rapidly than you're used to it occurring. For fast Ethernet, the real motivating factor behind, behind fast Ethernet is its responsiveness, not just greater bandwidth. What do I mean by this? Well, if you look at the computer on your desk, what does that computer do most of the day? What it does most of the day is, in fact, nothing. One of the things I like to say is that the companies who develop operating systems are constantly inventing new and more exciting operating systems that enable most of our computers to do nothing in new and more exciting ways. The point is that this is a resource, and when you use that resource, you want it to be very responsive and very rapid to your request. If it's just sitting there, if it's not doing anything, you don't really care about how fast or how slow it is. You only care about its responsiveness to your needs. When Ethernet was first started being deployed about 12 years ago, it was 10 megabits per second. The requirements of those desktops in terms of the applications they ran and the kinds of operations they performed were much simpler and much less complex than they are today. Today, the amount of data transfer just to load a program into memory is many, many times more than it was 12 years ago. The problem has become that those 10 megabit networks have not scaled their performance with the scaling performance of the desktops that they serve. To keep pace with not only the application size increase, but also the increase in the size of the data objects those applications manipulate, much greater responsiveness is required. The way to accomplish this in a simple manner is to increase the rate at which the underlying network can respond to requests made on it by the end systems. And these days, for example, a 10 megabyte file for a large presentation could be considered to be typical. To load this file across a 10 megabit network minimally would take about 10 seconds or so to occur. However, that same file load taking place across a 100 megabit network would take about one second to occur. That difference in response time to the end user of that application would be very pronounced and very noticeable. To keep up with the changing demands of the desktop, we have to upgrade the infrastructure, and upgrading infrastructure is something which is very, very difficult to do because that infrastructure is in place and operational. So when you have to upgrade infrastructure, you do it in a very careful, low-change, low-risk manner. And in this case, it's something which is much more complex than merely changing a network adapter on a particular end system with a newer, faster network adapter. All the changes that you're making have rippling effects on the other part of the network and on people who maintain and care for those networks. So we have to look at that it's not just one infrastructure that's being upgraded, but actually several infrastructures which are being upgraded. Now here are four of the more obvious infrastructure you have to consider when you're upgrading networks. The first one that most people would think about when you say the word infrastructure is the physical infrastructure. The physical infrastructure is actually the wiring and how the network is connected together. If we have to do a large amount of alteration or change, then it's very risky and very expensive to upgrade a network. Once again, on the idea that as you upgrade network infrastructure, you do the lowest amount of change with the lowest risk. If possible, you want to reuse the existing physical infrastructure directly in each part of the upgrade. 
The next infrastructure that we're in the process of upgrading is the procurement infrastructure. There are a tremendous number of vendors in place to sell 10 megabit solutions. A lot of knowledge is in place, a lot of expertise in developing those solutions and creating very reliable, low-cost solutions that can be sold through channels to end users. If we're going to upgrade this infrastructure, then the procurement infrastructure has to be upgraded also. So vendors and the channels through which they sell and the methods by which people just buy the networks have to be changed the least and in a way that the channels understand how to make and sell the new network, whatever sort of network that may be. As I touched on briefly in talking about the procurement infrastructure, there's another infrastructure I refer to as the knowledge infrastructure. If you think about it, a large number of people have been trained over the years on how to maintain, care for, and diagnose Ethernet networks. A tremendous knowledge base is represented here. If the network technology changes significantly, that would cause a very significant retraining time and expense. And further, there would be a learning curve for the support staff to come up to the same level of expertise and maturity as they had on the previous network technology. And then finally, the infrastructure I want to touch on is the application infrastructure. The application infrastructure is all those programs, all those network management programs, all those network applications that run on top of a network. These programs interact with the network and they have some knowledge of how that network operates. If the network operation changes drastically, these applications may have to be retuned or maybe even rewritten. So, reviewing these infrastructures with the notion of fast Ethernet in mind, Ethernet is the dominant networking technology today. The notion behind creating fast Ethernet and upgrading the infrastructure is that Ethernet at a higher speed is very similar to Ethernet at a lower speed. In fact, the IEEE, the standard body which standardized Ethernet, has already standardized Ethernet at two speeds. 1 megabit per second and 10 megabits per second. So in effect, there's already a template in place on how to standardize Ethernet at multiple speeds. The notion behind fast Ethernet was to standardize a version of Ethernet at 100 megabits per second. The IEEE has chosen to call this 100 base T based on the 10 base T uh, Ethernet at 10 megabits per second. We can maximally leverage the physical infrastructure, the procurement infrastructure, the knowledge infrastructure, and finally the application infrastructure by merely offering a solution with which you're already familiar and you already understand how it works, but it's just operating at a different speed. A network is always going to be in migration. And that means that pieces of the network will be of older technology, but other pieces may be of a newer technology. In general, you can assume that a network is a mixture of technology and that this is a very reasonable assumption to make for many years to come. When you think about that, that means you would like to have a technology that from a maintenance and management point of view is as uniform as possible. This again brings us back to an Ethernet, and in particular a fast Ethernet solution. Ethernet is dominant in the install base of network nodes in the world today. Therefore, it's reasonable to assume that any new network technology will have to coexist with 10 megabit Ethernet for many years. When you think about that, it makes sense that fast Ethernet is the simplest network to coexist with 10 megabit Ethernet. It's just a faster version, namely 100 base T. But since we've been talking about Ethernet so much, I want to step back for just a few minutes, review briefly what Ethernet is, how it works, the options available for Ethernet at this point in time. The underlying mechanism for Ethernet is summed up in the acronym CSMA-CD. Sometimes it seems as though all technologies have to have an underlying acronym, and that one happens to be Ethernet. CSMA-CD stands for Carrier Sense, Multiple Access, Collision Detect. Each of these concepts is actually very simple and can be best explained by an analogy with the telephone. Carrier Sense merely means that you can detect the presence of someone else in the network. Taking it to the telephone analogy, it means you can pick the phone up, listen to it, and hear whether or not someone else is speaking at this instant in time. Lois, you'll never guess. My son Paul is in California making a video. My mom, 
How, how she got this number, I don't know. Multiple access merely means that the multiple systems can access the network at the same time. Again, going back a little bit in telephone history, party lines where you have multiple access in the same telephone line used to be fairly common. And you could pick up the phone and there would actually be several people, several different phones accessing the telephone line. So how do you like that? A video. Gladys, is your son Paul in a rock band? Well, I don't think so. Collision detect, as foreboding as it may sound, is again very easily explained by the telephone analogy. When you're talking on the telephone, you're also listening. And as you listen, if you hear someone else start talking, you know that they probably didn't hear you correctly. Hi, Paul, Mom. Are you in a I Paul, are you in a rock band? Mom, I'm not in a rock band, but I can't talk right now. I promise. I promise I'll call you later, okay? Talk to you later. This is the same thing that occurs with Ethernet with collision detect. When a particular system transmitting on an Ethernet network is listening to determine whether or not someone else is also transmitting. If it detects that someone else has started transmitting, it knows they probably didn't hear it correctly and therefore it would simply retransmit the packet. Ethernet was originated at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC. The primary inventor of Ethernet is generally considered to be Bob Metcalf, who was one of the founders of 3Com. Bob saw very early on that networking, to be a success, had to have the support of a large number of companies, and that networking by its nature as a communications mechanism had to be open. So Bob, along with some other people, managed to get three companies together, Digital Equipment Corporation, Intel, and Xerox. They wrote the first Ethernet standards. The second Ethernet standard, called version 2, or the Blue Book, is often referred to as the DIC standard, which stands for Digital, Intel, and Xerox. This standard was put forward into the newly formed IEEE Project 802, which was an effort for the IEEE organization to standardize local area and metropolitan area networks. In 802, Ethernet became part of the 802.3 working group and was standardized in a form very similar to, but not exactly the same as, the digital Intel Xerox standard. However, the standard was fully backward compatible, so that even today, most networks run a significant mixture of 802.3 style Ethernet with the digital Intel Xerox style Ethernet. Ethernet has been phenomenally successful over the years. The current install base of Ethernet is around 50 million nodes or so, and the new shipment rate is roughly 15 million nodes per year. This compares to Token Ring, which is the next largest networking topology. Token Ring has an install base of roughly oh, about 10 million nodes and an annual shipment rate of around 3 to 4 million nodes. All other networking topologies, for example, FDDI, ATM, ARCnet, and the other various and sundry networks account for less than 1% of the remaining shipment rate in the stall base. The original version of Ethernet was designed to operate with this cable, which is known as ThickNet, TIMBASE 5 cable, or was often referred to as simply the big yellow cable. As you can see, it actually is fairly thick, and it was very expensive. So not very long after ThickNet was standardized, a less expensive solution was desired. This was called ThinNet, which just simply uses a much thinner coax and is much less expensive. Both of these are laid out in a bus topology. The thick net was designed to be able to have additions of 500 meters between active components. The thin net was designed to have a distance of 200 meters between active components. The fact that both of these are bus topologies implies that the network itself goes into and out of each office area. This makes it vulnerable to being connected or open in such a way that the network becomes broken. This prompted the need for work groups to create a new style of wiring. This style of wiring became known as TIM-based T. It uses unshielded twisted pair cabling. You can't really understand the unshielded twisted pair nature of it until you take the insulation off. Once you take the insulation off the cable, you can actually see the wire pairs which are twisted together. Twisted pair cable comes in various grades. The difference between the grades is that from the highest quality cable to the lowest quality cable, 
the number of twists decreases. And this set of cables, this is category 5 cable, is the highest quality cable, has the most number of twists. This is category 4 cable, which has a lower number of twists. And finally, category 3 cable, which is, as you can see, has almost no twists, which are discernible. The advantage of this style of implementing Ethernet is that the star-wired physical cable plant goes back to a wiring closet. This gives much more control over the physical cable plant. An end system can disconnect or connect to the network since there's an active component between each end system and every other end system. Then, if a particular segment begins having problems, it can be partitioned from the network. So unlike the situation where someone could disconnect the bus in their office, it's extremely difficult for someone to cause a problem to affect other nodes on the network in more than a transient fashion by merely connecting or disconnecting equipment. In addition to TIM-based T, another popular way of implementing Ethernet for larger segments, much larger than, say, 500 meters, is TIM-based F. This is a fiber optic solution which uses fiber optic cable. The fiber optic cable is very small and very light, much different than the coax or twisted pair cables. Over the years, the TIM-base 5 and TIM-base 2 solutions, the thick net and thin net solutions, have become much less popular. The TIM-base T solution has become the dominant workgroup solution with the TIM-base F fiber solution providing the most popular way to connect long distances. The original Ethernet networks were typically laid out as very large repeated networks, which could have spans of over 2,000 meters. Over time, again through the desire to have more control and make the networks more robust, similar to the considerations that went to changing from the coax media to TIM-base T, the larger networks have pretty much disappeared. The reason is, just as is in the coax case, you can have people affecting their operational network by plugging equipment into a large repeated shared network. This means that the nodes would behave incorrectly in the network could affect a large number of other nodes. So what has occurred is that networks have become increasingly segmented with bridges and switches, each separating pieces of Ethernet and acting as firewalls between these pieces of Ethernet. This prevents individual systems which are behaving incorrectly in the network from affecting a large number of other systems. Essentially, the notion is that traffic is only directed to more or less its final destination, so that large number of nodes cannot affect the traffic from a system which is misbehaving. And now on the fast Ethernet. One of the things that started happening a few years ago was that people who had been working on Ethernet for some time had seen the complexity of the implementation of Ethernet to go from a board such as this to a board such as this. The difference is quite striking. The large boards were expensive. They were complex to build and difficult at the time with the state of technology. However, in the 12 years that Ethernet has been commonly deployed to desktops, technology has improved dramatically. Today, the boards are much simpler, much more reliable, easier to build, and come at a much lower cost. A few years ago, people started realizing that the primary cost differential with modern technology between running Ethernet at 10 megabits versus a higher speed was actually not the Ethernet controller itself, nor the host interface, but primarily just the transceiver. The transceiver is the piece of equipment that actually communicates directly on the physical medium. This realization got several people thinking that maybe a fast version of Ethernet would be so attractive due to the large amount of Ethernet already deployed in the world. A group of vendors who thought along these lines got together and formed an organization called the Fast Ethernet Alliance. The alliance was primarily formed to facilitate the development of 100 megabit CSMACD and to facilitate development of standards for 100 megabit solutions and interoperability mechanisms so that vendors could test products and make sure that they interoperate properly. This organization now has over 60 members, including manufacturers who account for over 80% of all Ethernet sold today. The Fast Ethernet Alliance has moved its proposals into IEEE 802.3. 802.3 was the working group which standardized Ethernet at 1 and 10 megabits per second. This group seemed to be the most reasonable place to standardize Ethernet at 100 megabits per second. This 802.3 working group has at this point in time completed a working group ballot on the 100 base T standard. This ballot passed 
and is currently in the comment resolution process. This resolution process is expected to complete by the end of 1994. As part of the standardizing 100 base T, their primary motivating factor was the ability to leverage so much of the existing standard. The new pieces of technology which need to be developed to make the 100 megabit standard were primarily the physical signaling portions. And here, the 802.3 working group has chosen to pursue three. They are 100 base T4, 100 base TX, and 100 base FX. Overall, the IEEE calls this effort 100 base T. This shows the direct descendancy from 10 base T. So what are these media options for 100 megabit Ethernet, and when would one choose one over the other? Well, the first option is called 100 base T4. 100 base T4 requires four pairs of category 3, 4, or 5 unshielded twisted pair cable. This is the same cable we looked at earlier. Category 3 unshielded twisted pair cable is currently the dominant twisted pair in the install base. Category 5 unshielded twisted pair cable is dominating all new installations. The lower the number in general is the lower the quality of the cable. So a solution which is designed to run on Category 3 cable, for example, generally can run very robustly with a tremendous amount of margin on Category 5 cable. So the primary feature of 100 base T4 is the fact that it will indeed support Category 3, the older cabling. And then when used on higher quality cabling, it's extremely high in its error margins and because it was designed to run on the much lower quality cable. The next media option is 100 base TX. TX is designed to run on Category 5 cable or the higher quality cable that we looked at earlier. Also, it runs on shielded twisted pair, which is called IBM Type 1. Unlike 100 base T4, it can't run on the lower quality cable. However, it does have features which compensate for this. T4 required all four pairs and can only transmit in a half duplex fashion. TX only requires two pairs and can transmit in a full duplex fashion. This means as a future upgrade, it's possible to have a 200 megabit per second full duplex solution uses, using TX, whereas with T4, you're limited to a 100 megabit solution. However, once again, T4 does operate over the lower quality cable than TX does. Finally, there's another solution, the fiber solution. That's called 100 base FX. This fiber solution uses the ANSI FTDI transceiver and is capable of full duplex operation of 2,000 meter runs of fiber between repeaters. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the trend over the years has been the shortened distances between active components. 10 base 5, that's the thick cable we looked at earlier, started out at 500 meters. This evolved to 10 base 2, the thin cable, which was 200 meters, and then finally to 10 base T, the twisted pair cable we looked at earlier, which was 100 meters. Based on the analysis which was done in coming out with the 100 meters for use with 10 base T, the decision was made to support 100 meters of twisted pair cable for 100 base T. The decision to go with 100 meters for 100 base T was based on analysis having to do with the percentage of all end systems within 100 meters of a wiring closet. 10 base T has rapidly become the dominant networking topology. This shows that the assumptions concerning the distance from wiring closet to end systems were in fact correct. Therefore, for 100 base T, the 100 meters between the end system and the wiring closet was kept exactly the same. This comes back to supporting the existing physical infrastructure. Also, as I mentioned earlier, the observation was made that modern networks are no longer large repeated networks. They have active components in them. These are usually switches or bridges, and these components act as firewalls. 100 base T takes advantage of this and is designed to fit very nicely into a switched or bridged network. IEEE 802.3 is defining two classes of repeaters, very originally called class 1 and class 2. A class 1 repeater is designed so that within a work group there will be only one repeater. The advantages of this repeater is that it can be very modular, very large, and can take maximum advantage of the, all the media options available to it. The class 2 repeater is designed so that equipment between multiple vendors can be intermixed within a single work group. It does not have quite the same flexibility as a class 1 repeater, 
but does have the advantage of being able to intermix multiple systems from multiple vendors in the same work group. The general topology rules for fast Ethernet are really very simple. If you have a point-to-point -point link, that is, such as a connection from a switch to another switch, fast Ethernet on fiber, a full duplex fiber solution can be 2,000 meters long. A half duplex solution can be 450 meters long. If you have a single connection, that is a single fiber running down from a single repeater, then that fiber can be 225 meters long. The repeater is connected to end systems by 100 meters of unshielded twisted pair or shielded twisted pair. If you have multiple repeaters, then the length of that fiber connection which connects the repeater to a switch or a bridge is limited to 100 meters. So the next question is, how will fast ethernet be deployed? Fast Ethernet will probably find its first deployment in autonomous work groups. These are small groups of people with large bandwidth needs. It could be CAD, CAM, publishing, imaging, or lots of other applications which are already straining a 10 megabit network. Often these work groups are already purchasing 100 megabit networks and would find Fast Ethernet a more cost-effective solution. In this scenario, it would probably link back to their existing 10 megabit network with a 10 megabit bridge. The next step will be the incorporation of downlinks. Fast Ethernet will provide a simple, low-cost downlink because the vendors of switching and bridging products will be able to leverage their knowledge of Ethernet and will also be able to leverage the high-volume Ethernet components in their switches and bridges. The obvious next place that Ethernet will find application is in server farms. Fast Ethernet will provide server farms with an inexpensive downlink technology due to the fact that there will be no technology conversion required between the server farm and the end systems, which will still be primarily 10 megabit Ethernet at the initial phases of Fast Ethernet deployment. Also, it will create the environment for a complete 100 megabit Ethernet solution as the network evolves. Then Fast Ethernet will probably begin floor distribution in a general way. Fast Ethernet is the most likely high-speed desktop solution in the near term because it's the most obvious low-cost way to provide networking services to high-end workstations such as Pentiums and power PCs. Further, it can leverage the tremendous knowledge base available of how Ethernet works and how to maintain it. Changing from Tim base T to 100 base T for most MIS groups will be less of a challenge than they experience in changing from coax to 10 base T. With, with 10 base T to 100 base T, the wiring stays the same, the management stays the same, the only thing that changes is speed. With coax to 10 base T, the wiring actually changed, some aspects of management changed. So for most MIS groups, there was actually a much greater change then going to 100 megabit will be for fast Ethernet. So now we've talked a little about how fast Ethernet will deploy. Let's talk a little bit about what products will spur this deployment. One of the first products that will spur deployment is the in-system adapters. Since 100 megabit Ethernet is a direct derivative from 10 megabit Ethernet, most of the adapters will probably be 10 slash 100 capable. Once again, this goes back to the technology realization that most of the cost differential between 10 megabit and 100 megabit is actually the transceiver or the signaling portion. Therefore, the price differential, particularly when the volume of 100 megabit Ethernet becomes larger, will not be significant. The expectation will be that a large number of end users will deploy 10 slash 100 cards because of the price. For example, 3Com has already announced a card like this. This is a 32-bit, 100 base T card. The price will be about $300. This compares to the existing 3Com card, which is also a 32-bit card. However, it's a 10 base T card, and its price is about $250. So the differential here is only about $50 from 10 megabits to 100 megabits. A lot of users will deploy this, mainly because the cost of coming back and upgrading the end system later will be worth far more than that $50 cost differential. So the notion will be to go ahead and deploy the card, 
Assuming that as the network infrastructure slowly changes, then this computer will not require additional labor to upgrade the adapter later. The next product will be 100 megabit repeaters and bridges. 100 megabit repeaters will work very much like 10 megabit repeaters. They will provide a shared medium of 100 megabits among a group of workstations, just like a 10 megabit repeater provides a shared medium of 10 megabits among a group of workstations. A product that will be a bit different for 100 megabits than it is for 10 megabits will be the early switches. Primarily, these devices will have 10 megabit ports with a small number of 100 megabit ports. These 100 megabit ports will be used for high-speed connections to servers or, or for downlinks. Analysis has shown that on switch solutions, to really get a significant performance advantage out of a switch 10 megabit Ethernet, a high-speed connection to the server is a requirement. Therefore, the early 10 slash 100 megabit switches will be targeted primarily at the 10 megabit install base with a high-speed connection to the server. Then, since networking is an enterprise solution, there will be 10 slash 100 megabit bridges and routers. This will probably be deployed as option modules, which you plug into existing routers or bridges. For example, this illustration shows a NetBuilder 2, which is a router device, and a Lamplex 6000, which is a switch device, connect directly to switched and shared 100 base T. This is through modules which are added to these devices. This gives enterprise-wide connectivity to a 100 megabit solution. This is critical for wide-scale deployment. Now we'll talk about the Ethernet family of solutions. Ethernet has evolved from what used to be just a 10 megabit shared solution to a set of four primary solutions. Those are shared 10 megabit, switch 10 megabit, shared 100, and switch 100. So when you think about this, what are the applications that would drive someone designing a network to choose one versus the other? Well, an overall consideration is the fact that family solutions exist so the single adapter in the end system can participate in each one of these solutions. This means you can do one installation in the end system and then upgrade the capabilities of the end system without having to actually modify the end system. One of the things that makes this possible is then the 802.3 standardization effort, the ability to automatically determine the capabilities of the network that the adapter is plugged into is included as part of the standard. This means that the adapter can be installed on the machine used on a 10 megabit network. Then say if the repeater is changed to a 100 megabit repeater, the adapter can automatically sense that fact and then just operate it at 100 megabits. So coming back to the primary set of solutions, the first primary solution is shared 10. Shared 10 with modern applications is starting to strain a little bit, particularly in any sort of high load situation. However, in work groups where the network load is not very high, and for example, where end users use networks primarily for email, Shared 10 is still a robust and good solution. As the network bandwidth demand increases, and in particular, if there are applications such as video applications, which demand a fair amount of sustained bandwidth, then switch 10 megabit becomes a good solution. The advantage of switch 10 megabit over shared 10 megabit is primarily that that 10 megabit bandwidth is dedicated and always available for each end system. However, many users who have been on shared networks which are not high utilization will not see a significant performance advantage with a switch 10 versus a shared 10 network. This is because it is often the case that on an instantaneous basis, that that user is actually getting all the shared 10 megabits because there's just one person trying to utilize the network at that point in time. The next step up in capability is shared 100. Shared 100 allows much greater responsiveness to applications that have a large amount of data, such as imaging and publishing applications. Also, as with switch 10, many kinds of multimedia can be effectively served by shared 100 solutions much more than, say, a shared 10 solution would be able to do. A switch 100 solution at this point in time may see a little too far out for a lot of computer users, but a lot of workstation users 
who have applications that can drive a large amount of data and require a large amount of bandwidth also want to be running video applications or other applications which demand a fair amount of sustained bandwidth. A Switch 100 Base T solution for these people will make a lot of sense. Again, a user on a lightly loaded 100 megabit shared network as opposed to a Switch 100 megabit network may not see a substantial gain in performance. However, if large numbers of people are running applications, again such as video and other applications that require dedicated bandwidth, then the perceived performance improvement will be quite significant. Now briefly, I'm going to talk about some of the high-speed alternatives for deployment in the workgroup. The first alternative, which I've already mentioned in the Ethernet family solutions, is switched Ethernet. Again, the advantage of switched Ethernet is that it leverages the adapters already in place and gives you a large amount of aggregate bandwidth. The disadvantage is that the bandwidth of each system is actually no greater than the bandwidth it had in the shared solution. The amount of performance improvement which would be perceived in such a network will depend on how often the network actually was in a state of significant contention, which a large number of end users attempting to use the network at absolutely the same time. Also, to see a large performance improvement under any condition, the connections to the server devices need to be of a speed much faster than 10 megabits, a role that the 100 megabit Ethernet would be very well suited to play. Another alternative is 100 VG AnyLAN. This solution is sometimes referred to as fast Ethernet, even though the underlying media access has nothing to do with the CSMA CD which characterizes true Ethernet. At this point in time, VG AnyLAN does not have the significant vendor support enjoyed by 100 Base T. Further, it does not leverage Ethernet as 100 Base T does, so there will be greater amounts of training required to use it. Also, there is intent to use 100 VG to provide an upgrade pass for token ring users. This makes its use in Ethernet networks a little more unclear than it might be. Another alternative is FDDI. FDDI is a well-proven, mature standard and offers a large amount of redundancy and fault tolerance. It also has built-in network management and is deployed quite widely for use on the backbone. The disadvantage of FDDI is that it has nowhere near the market penetration of Ethernet. Therefore, there is more training associated with using it. It is a more complex network and therefore requires a much higher level of training to be properly understood and diagnosed. Probably the most widely talked about high-speed alternative is ATM. Since ATM is not really quite fully born yet, it has the advantage that a lot of its features are still being designed. However, that is also a disadvantage in that ATM is not yet a fully stable enterprise network technology. Also, ATM was designed to be an extremely effective network technology for switches as one gets closer and closer to the end systems. And in particular, as you're covering that last 100 meters from the last intermediate system to the end system itself, the advantages of ATM over Ethernet or other LAN technologies become much less pronounced. So that for some time to come, it's very reasonable to expect that ATM will gain ground in campus backbones and building backbones, but that the work group will remain other technologies primarily because of the greater existence of knowledge, the large install base, and the lower cost. So now, let's summarize. As I said at the beginning of my talk, the primary motivation behind 100 Base T is improved responsiveness on networks and additional functionality at the least possible change to the existing infrastructure. Also, the intent is to provide that functionality at a very low cost. We've seen that companies such as 3Com are introducing products at close to the cost of 10 megabit Ethernet, even though the performance is 10 times greater. Because it's all based on Ethernet, 100 base T Ethernet is a simple, straightforward, incremental migration plan from an existing infrastructure. New adapters can be used at either 10 or 100 megabits. There are going to be switches which can be used at either 10 or 100 megabits. The ability to put the amount of bandwidth you need where you need it in the most cost-effective fashion is a central capability of the Ethernet family of solutions. Further, since the network management 
for 100 megabit Ethernet will be the same as 10 megabit Ethernet. And since the installation and maintenance will be the same as for 10 megabit Ethernet, the tremendous knowledge base concerning how Ethernet works, how to use it, and how to maintain it is preserved. This allows MIS organizations to upgrade the capability of the network without having to retrain their staff. So let me leave you with this. I and a lot of other people whose names you may never know have spent the last two years developing this technology. What's driven me, and I believe many of the others as well, is the idea that we are creating a platform for future applications that few of us can even imagine now. I hope I've managed to convey some of our excitement and that you've enjoyed hearing about it. Thank you very much for listening.